Connor. Welcome to the studio. Hello. How are you, man? <laughs> yeah, I'm not too bad, thank you. How are you doing? Yeah, not bad, not bad. I'm excited to have you in. Cause thank you. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. It's always, I don't know, it's, it's strange having people on that I literally meeting for the first time and like <laughs> but it was kind of it was a cool experience because i saw your instagram and stuff so it was like yeah. intrigued so when you ask and it turned out you were like friends with harry and stuff i was like yeah fucking perfect yeah i just thought like well, yeah why not like i saw harry did the podcast and i was like damn that was really good there was just some really interesting like talking points that were just going on and so i was like damn i think that would just be really nice to kind of maybe not go there with a specific goal in mind of like promoting something or talking about something specific but as a way to kind of engage in a conversation about like imagery photography and like visual culture at the moment and we kind of did yeah. that already from having like a little <laughs> talk previously and I feel like damn we got a ball rolling in a way and yeah, yeah. It's, it's nice I think it's like a nice way to kind of just like figure out where your intentions are lying at the moment and so, yeah, that's why I don't have really have something like incredibly specific of like a project that I'm promoting or some sort of thing that I'm going with. But And I think that's what I always wanted the show to be, just about mm. artists, their creative process, not necessarily like a specific thing um, and just their philosophy. Because like you said, those conversations about visual culture and ideas and stuff are actually... Um, hard to come by post-university... Yeah, it, it kind of feels like when you bring it up, you're like, people look at you like you're kind of crazy. Like, a little bit. Like, they're like, it's not that deep, dude. Get yeah, over I feel it. like when I'm kind of talking about it, I'm like that, the meme of like um, Charlie and Always Sunny, where he's got like the board oh, yeah, behind him. Like, and I'm just like, this is it. This is visual <laughs> subculture right now. Are you not seeing it? And everyone's just like, <sighs> no, I'm not. <laughs> oh, so you take photos. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, I take photos. Like,. <laughs> But, but yeah, it's it's an extremely strange thing because it was that's why I was quite excited meeting Harry and you because mm. I like when I met Harry I didn't realize he'd like just finished university and yeah. like being to him he like had that um, just way of talking I was like I miss this because a lot of yes. people like hang out with like the studio space is like an artistic space and trying yes. to do that but you still come across people who are like you say those people who are like not on that level yeah and it's also like the you know, uh, intellect Harry has as well. He's like a very intellectual and I feel like he can always like say the right thing or put into words what you're trying to like describe yeah. in certain ways. I, I, it, the experience I describe it as is like you'd say 20 words and then he'd give it back to you in like two. <laughs> and you'd be like, yeah, that's exactly that, that's it. That's literally <laughs> like one of my biggest like things that I get annoyed with is like how I can say something really long. And then someone be like, oh, I get it like this. And they can put it into like 10 words. Mm. And I'm like, oh my God. Well, like it's always, it's like a, like a joy and a curse at the same time. It's mm. like amazing that someone can do that and like translate what you've said in so many words into so many few and still get it to the exact point that you're at. But then you're almost like to yourself, like, oh damn, why can't I yeah, be why? so more concise? <laughs> like, I think that's the thing It's like the ability to be concise. Yeah. And it's, um, especially important in photography like we were talking about uh four words in books the other day yes and like that being because realistically in the book it's like normally like one page a couple paragraphs mm. just to get across like that stuff that you as the photographer has been like talking to people about for months mm. but it tends to be like a 40 minute pot conversation before you're like oh yeah and i think they've got it now but then yeah. someone goes and writes it down so like eloquently and you're just like perfect put it's, that at the front everyone needs to it's like the read that. it's like the introduction or the foreword for the americans is it by robert that's robert frank, frank yeah yes thank god i got that right <laughs> i'd be like damn you don't know your stuff caught out on the podcast um but it's like the foreword was written by jack kerouac and he'd done like books on like poetry and i haven't really yeah. read too much of kerouac's work but i i know that he has got this way with writing that is very fluid and poetry like. Yeah, and well, so he was he was Beat Generation, right? So that was yes. when poetry was sort of that that's the big the forefront of these writers. Yeah, it's like self expression mm. and kind of voicing that, and to have that at the beginning of the Americans, where this was like a big pinnacle, like street photography mm. body of work, and then for him to kind of be voicing it, kind of gave it this like. 
it's almost like a, a thrill at the end of like your signature, you know, it, it, it complemented the work beautifully mm. and it kind of like rose up to like another level that I haven't really, yeah, didn't really see before within photography. I think for me, I originally approached photo books by just like flicking through and looking at the imagery. Mm. But then as time has gone on, I've like looked more at like the forward and kind of seen how a piece of writing can instantly not not change, but it can always. Um, it's like a gentle, warm hand against yeah. an image. It can almost. It's just like compliments it. Yeah, you know? it feels like putting it into, like, make it a photography term, like focusing it. Like, it, yes, it exactly. The lens because you could be coming at it from any angle. I don't know. You could have just gone to the zoo and you could be focusing on the birds in the sky and the book and the book's nothing about that. It just happens to be a penguin in the background or yeah, something. Yeah, exactly. So it kind of puts you in the correct mindset to experience the intention of the images. Yes. Which, there's a, there's a thing where it could be taken as though, does that mean the images are so open to interpretation that you mm. have to have something to explain them? Or is it just that people don't know how to read the images so it requires that sort of um, forward function as almost like a, re, a what's it called the Rosetta Stone like yeah. the, to translate it into something that's a bit more uh, digestible so you know yeah that whatever your theories about it aren't just completely off in some weird tangent yeah and I think that's like kind of where we're getting to with this like conversation of like looking at the forward within a photography book and how I feel like when you start your journey off in like maybe self-publishing and making books, you start from a point of like, I'm making a zine. And mm. I feel like the culture around that is very much that I think it feels like a seesaw effect. It feels like some people are like, zines have huge parts in like photography and art culture. And I think it just is really substantial. And then on the other side, it's seen as, it's a zine. It's smaller than a photo book. It might be seen lesser than a photo book or an artistic book in itself. And so then I think you kind of get wrapped up into this idea of, oh, I'm making it, so I'll choose the graphic design. I will choose the sequencing. I'll choose my font. I'll choose my cover. Mm -hmm. I'll design everything because it's me. And then... I think you hit this point when you're making stuff where you're like, actually, I can I can ask for a writer to write my forward or I can speak to a graphic designer who would like to design, you know, the cover of this work or how the sequencing is going to look or what's the font or how we not only communicating imagery, but how we communicating the experience of the book itself. Yeah, and as well, the the sort of, that becomes a new kind of, selection process you have to go through of like yes. um the book i have that's the next one i'm releasing is the first one i've done with a forward for for a long time i'll caveat because i did have a forward in another book written by someone else but like a proper i felt a bit more rigorous of a forward yeah and it was like a bit of an agonizing process being like oh, who because you can't because like you say, like Jack Kerouac for uh, Robert Frank, it yeah. makes perfect sense. He was like this, Kerouac was an American writer at a similar time. He had that poetic elegance, but he was also a bit rough yeah. around the edges, which made sense. If he had got someone else to write it, it would have, you're kind of at the mercy of the writer. Yeah. To, they can completely change how your work seen for it there's that idea that once you put work out there especially in photography it's no longer yours and people can say what they want about it so the forward to me feels a little bit like trying to retain some control yes even though you're passing that responsibility to someone else but that passing of the responsibility is almost like how i visualize you passing a baton in like a relay race mm. you're all on the same goal yeah to finish essentially so when the writer is writing your forward you're handing that baton to them and obviously their job or their responsibility is obviously to write something that is captivating yes to you as the person who's just handed them that responsibility however I think what I like about it and the process of having someone else write a forward or writing a forward within collaboration with a, a writer per se is that you're going to see something fresh from someone else's eyes. Someone who might be a little bit more 
inclined to open up a dialogue that you might not have seen. I think for me, like I, I said it the other day, I, f- uh, I feel I'm quite simple within my photography and how I describe it at times. I think it comes from a position of the heart and it comes from a position of feeling. And so it's very human to me. And so then when someone rips it apart and kind of like digests it and kind of tries to like put a magnifying thing to it, it can kind of seem as like, well, whoa, like you're tearing apart me. Mm. However, when you have like a good discourse, and a good conversation with a writer, a writer can get to know you and get to know the body of work and kind of amalgamate these two things together. Mm. And so I think for me, the only process that I'd find quite uneasy is if I was giving it to a writer who I'd had no clue about like I didn't really know their work or their rhythm or their tone of when you're writing Mm. because that's something that again we were speaking about is like how I do want to kind of move a little bit more into writing and I'm kind of trying to slowly find my voice the voice which I found within photography somehow Mm. and the visual like dialogue that I'm having with images I've always kind of wanted to have that within writing but it's almost like I can hear it and feel it but I can never get it down onto paper. And so I think that's like when you can find someone who gets you and gets your style and can kind of pull out these things, I think you can create like a really beautiful, not just a forward, but a really beautiful book from that experience. Mm. Because not only does the forward like set everything up, obviously you could just pick up the book and just disregard the forward yeah. entirely. Which however, we've all done. <laughs> yes. However, the people who pay attention to it especially you yourself when you've sent it off to a writer they've come back to you and they've then given you a forward and you've gone fuck this is amazing like, i love this i'm gonna put this into my indesign document blah 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 put it in print it when you get that back physically it's a brand new book in my eyes because you have that forward that then mm. changes things like entirely in a way which i think is like a very beautiful process but that, that's kind of why i see it as like you're handing a baton to someone and they're carrying on that next leg of the race yeah. for you because it is a it's not only a process but it is a it is a teamwork effort i think yeah 100 percent. It's, it's collaboration and i think it's um it depends how how much you want to lean into being sort of i guess experimental because yes. i imagine there's sometimes where you you kind of go through that process to select something or select someone to do a certain job Mm. so that they'll do it essentially to fill in that translation from what's in your head to not being able to get it into like a physical yeah. page but um there I, I found the experience weird because it was like i kind of knew what i wanted it to say just couldn't say it myself yes and as well felt that like if it was coming from me the people would <sighs> hmm you you always have that thing of your that thing in the back of your head that's being like you're just mate you're just chatting a bunch of shit <laughs> so it, like the process with the writer was to hand her the book like completely blank see what she wrote yes then if she was along the wrong, right lines which luckily she was then to give her the extra context that would enable her to like fill it in even more yeah as if she had brought back the first draft and had been like yeah you've you've misinterpreted yeah, the like, whole thing on here? and it was like for me that felt like oh so someone can translate it into writing that means i must be along some kind of like i'm not completely crazy like you know i mean yeah. that's the feeling it was like oh it, it does make some sort yes. of sense to someone else i think that's like kind of the process that i'm in at the moment when i'm making books and making dummies it's like okay i'm gonna send this off to print small amount of copies and then I'm going to send them off to writers or mm. graphic designers or people that I know who are like in my artistic circle who can look at it, be critical of it, not to an extent of where it, you're trashing it, but being yeah. real and mm. honest with myself and the work and they can put across their feelings. So for writers, for example, I'd probably give them the pages where I'd want the writing to be blank. So then yeah. if they want to use my photo book as a notebook to kind of digest these thoughts and mm. feelings they're having around the work, I think that's a really cool experience to have, especially with graphic designers yeah. as well. Like to, there's been countless times where I've just given graphic designers like a bunch of my images and just gone here, if you want to like play and make something from it, yeah. go ahead. Like I like that. 
and it's less about me being like trying to like lay back in my chair and be like, ah, oh, cool, just handing off the work to everyone else. Yeah. It's more the fact of like, I'm still figuring out myself of what I'm trying to communicate with my work. So having someone else have a fresh perspective mm. of it and a fresh look yeah. at it, it well, opens up more of a conversation and more ways that the work can, I, th- I think, can be digested in a way. And they'll see things that you didn't. And especially when you've described your work as like from the heart and very personal, there is mm. that element of like possibly you ending up too close to it. Yes. And going down because... <sighs> It's strange, you're always producing work that's kind of like a lot of the people who work within this sort of, let's say, style or approach to photography, you're always making work that kind of boils down to at some level about yourself. Yeah. And the risk with that is if you're too linear or it becomes too about yourself, then people just go, why am I scrolling through your camera roll on your phone? Like, yes. And you have to bring something that's like inspiring or interesting or bring something to the table to make them relate it back to themselves. Yes. Which when you show it to other people, naturally they'll find what speaks to them within stuff that even if it is a story about you, mm. they'll find, they'll, they'll impose themselves onto it somewhat. And that's... yes the what they're trying to get every viewer to do to connect to the work yeah which is something which i like but i'm also like still figuring out if if i have like a like or dislike between it in a way Mm -hmm. because i think any experience you take from personal work or any artistic work i think it's an experience in itself yeah so if someone Mm -hmm. like you showed a book and it was things that people really didn't like like the look of let's Mm. say like a group of people like i can hate this project it looks awful i don't know why i like this Mm. like it's incredibly like fucked with my brain Mm. to me you've experienced something you've come away with an experience and let's say a group of other people like this fucking sick this is like the best thing i've ever seen this is like absolutely pushing photography or art Mm. in a brand new way that i haven't seen before it's rebellious it's provoking it is i'm going home and i'm thinking about it yeah. Equally, it's a seesaw. I think that whenever you publish or put something out into the world, you're always going to get like an opinion that will go up one way and down the other, where some people will be like, I really like this work. And then other people will be like, I don't like this work. And these are the reasons why. But even to take from that, for me, that then there's still a, there's still a discourse. There's still that conversation there around it. And as an yeah. artist and a photographer, I think I really like finding out the way that people not only view images and view art but the perspectives and opinions behind it because i think it 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 makes the work Mm. real there's a conversation behind it like you look at ad campaigns and you look at how people promote work if you can do something in a provoking way wherever it's liked or disliked you're still going to have clicks you're still going to have people talking about it whether it's good or bad Mm. like there's that old saying isn't it it's like no like was it like no not no promotion but like um, oh, all press is good press. Yeah, yeah. like that, that, that sort of thing. Mm. And it, it can, you know, if you can take the, the heat of negative, you know, onlookings on your work or if you can happily sit there and be like, mm. yeah, that's cool, like, I like that, then I think it then opens up a new line of going, okay, now with imagery, like where do I want to go? Do I, am mm. I being appeasing Am I doing it deliberately yeah. now to unease people? It's it's like hunting for not... Worrying less about the the emotion being, like, good or bad, yeah. but more being concerned with, like, how complex an emotion you can elicit. Like, exactly. is someone going to ponder it and have new thoughts off the back of it, or mm. are they going to... You know, the the basic level of, like, what you see online, it's like, if you want to go viral, the goal is to get someone to either go... I love this or I fucking hate it and no more than that that the space in the middle which is like you if you want to go viral you won't want something that someone then like sleeps on and then kind of ponders and then comes back to two or three times and then it's kind of going well maybe it's this I'm not sure sure I'll have to look at it again like that by that time you've lost people in the attention base well but in art that's where you get interesting stuff well that that's like the disparity between let's say 
a late 1960s provoke era mm. comparative to 2024 it's attention it is mm. oh i like this or i dislike this not something that's kind of disrupting a status quo like well i say that but like you look at uh, so for example on instagram i saw a reel the other day where someone was like got photo film back and was like isn't this how you scan it or is it isn't this how you use it and they were just like scratching it like on purpose or like like spilling water over it and then the amount that it was like viral Mm. was crazy and all the comments were literally just like how are you doing this like oh my god that's not how you scan film (laughs) like oh my god i can't believe that Mm. you're actually doing this like what a waste of money and then i'm literally looking at the amount of shares the amount of likes Mm. the amount of bookmarks and i'm just like that's it's incredible like, it's phenomenal that you could wind someone up from home and it go viral <laughs> and then i'm just like well don't artists do that all the time don't they just mm. but i think within where we see it on a big stage like fine art it's more as a rebellious act where because if you have a big name doing something uh, that's quite bold and garish a lot of people might go holy shit that's insane like that's mm. absolutely incredible that's a, a phenomenal piece of work whereas if it was just a regular person doing it not with the same backing of art institution yeah. money status people might just be like well, what the fuck are you doing like for example yeah. like alexander mcqueen um mm. one of his shows when he was still alive for a fashion brand i remember there was basically a dress that a lady walked out in and there was like a robot arm that was like spraying her with oh, like the paint. black paint yeah like phenomenal idea mm. like it, mm. crazy like just to change the idea of a fashion show and the construct of it and then people have done that with like exhibition formats as well moving away from a traditional exhibition space and more of something non-traditional yeah. like a house the idea or, of the installation and things yeah like that. and so there's always this challenge within art and i think art has now moved into a media basis now because of everything is that it's in front of us now like you can have content creators post about stuff about being creative Mm. and there's like one guy online who i see who makes all these like stylistic things and it reminds me of like a mixture between like his aesthetic is a mix between like matrix and wes anderson and he like stands in front of a camera and talks quite nonchalantly about photography or art and how you're how you're not Mm. you're not unmotivated you're just distracted and it's all of this and it's like 30 seconds and i'm like okay cool but i felt nothing from that i just felt like you were grabbing my attention with cool different camera Mm. shots and saying something which if i wanted to hear it i would go listen to like a one-hour podcast of loads of people talking Mm. about picking yourself up and self-motivation and or i'd go read something yeah you've said one line from an exempt from like a book, for example, made like a 30 second reel out of it. That's stylistically Mm. very cool. It's done really well, but it hasn't challenged anything. It's kind of just copied. And so gone along with the, that culture of hustling and grinding and, and then kind of coming back to the beginning of where I said provoke era in the sixties, a lot was talked about, copies of things of copies of images copies of reality like we're not taking photographs we're copying the life that is in front of us and so something is never the original it's always a copy of something and so things kind of become diluted down within some sense because i think when you think about making copies you think of this mundane practice of maybe like a photocopier or just copying files on a computer and you think, oh, this is just becoming less and less worthwhile. This is becoming less real as like an original, yeah. for example. However, I think it sparks a whole other conversation of, well, if everything is just a copy, then origin- at some point we're going to break into something where it's so new that it references all the previous copies beforehand. Mm. Instead of copying them, it just references them or notices that they exist instead of being like I'm a new thing it it admits that it is a copy of everything that was copied in the past and kind of becomes its own own new thing like I mean you've you've had a sort of generation of artists like that and especially in uh cinema like 
Tarantino is yes, you know, it's it's basically a series of references put to, like remixed yes. and put together, and like Wes Anderson to a extent as well. It's like yes, the guys who are really really tight stylistically mm. tend to be because they have such like nailed in influences. Um, but that's when it's within the same medium. You could also argue cross the, medium ones as well, but they're slightly less obvious. But there's a point of where if you're allowed to do that as a creative, mm. especially in like on a big stage, just like a director, mm. you've got your budget, your cast, everything. There's a moment of where you're ending up just almost like copying off the idyllic versions of what you created previously. Like, mm. for example, with like Wes Anderson, like I can think of countless movies where I'm like, this is gold. This is great. Like uh, Royal Tannenbaum's, yeah. uh, Fantastic Mr. Fox. Oh, I'm going to be really bad here, not know all his films. <laughs> but um, if another one pops into my mind, I'll be like that one. But like um, for me, after a while, I'm no longer watching like a Wes Anderson film. I'm just mm. watching almost like a the next installment of the creative journey, which he's creating. And so after a while, the expectations you come in with are expectations that you want to be m matched from your previous viewings of their yeah. almost creative cinema. Which, yeah, happened to Tarantino, Jackie Brown. Yes. Wasn't Pulp Fiction 2 and everyone was like, Ugh. and then within the last few years, really, people have come back around to and be gone, like, Jackie Brown's incredible. Actually, like, Jackie Brown's like yeah. one of his best almost, like, but the, um, I think there's a difference between, like, the comparison between a Wes Anderson and Tarantino. It's like, a Wes Anderson, you know what you're going to get because it's going to mm. be quirky. It's going to have similar cast members, same as, like, Tarantino. Yeah. He likes revisiting, you know, his his almost, like, group of people. But yeah. I think Anderson, Wes Anderson, Anderson has... pushes it to He a has a level of, like... Huge amount of, mm. like, cast that he can pull from. And it's... It, a Wes Anderson film feels like... Um, it feels in a way now that it's hit that Hollywood pinnacle for me. Right. Where it's like, oh, okay, it's this cast members come in and, oh my God, it's, hey, it's another, you know, uh, it's uh, Jeff Goldblum again in another thing. And, oh my God, he's playing this character. And, oh my God, you've got um, Timothy Chalamet. Yeah. Or, or, oh my God, you've got um, like uh, just Willem Dafoe. You've just yeah. got any of them. And I, for me, where I follow it with his is like, less of like the quirky storytelling of like how he has a wide shot or how everything's really symmetrical or mm. really colorful or it's like very quirky it's more the fact of i focus on the story like grand budapest hotel okay the payoff is i don't know if i feel a payoff in the film other than just the easiness of it's a wes anderson film it's gonna be easy going there's gonna be yeah. nice things to look at whereas tantino it's like damn you're gonna there's going to be a scene where everyone gets fucked up, everyone's going to get shot or killed or stabbed, yeah. but it's, it's building it's, constantly mm. to those moments. And like, um, what's the one in Hollywood? What's it called? Once upon a time in Hollywood. That's it. Yeah. That one is just like a full film of build-up. Uh, I feel yeah, like... Yeah, till the last... The, the, last only, the only slight let-off you have... In the middle of the film is where Brad Pitt punches someone. That's yeah, it. yeah, and that's where all he's like get. fighting like, um, Bruce Lee. <laughs> oh yeah, that's oh yeah. There's like just small, tiny nothing, and then at the end it just goes like. But that's yeah, the whole thing bombastic. with like being that creative. It's like you, you imagine you start off with well, Tarantino started off with Reservoir Dogs, and that film to me is one of my favorite Tarantino films. I just. I like it for its storytelling. I like just how it's shot, how it's about a bank robbery, but you never see the robbery happen. You just see the events before and after and everything that happens around it. And then you're hit with Pulp Fiction and everyone's like, oh my God, Pulp Fiction is like one of the biggest like masterpieces in cinema history. But I think where a lot of people kind of shit on fans of Pulp Fiction or like the, the archetype of the the guy who's like my favourite film is Inception, Pulp like Fiction films that become film Fight films. Clubs yeah exactly, yeah. it's like but it it's good for it's like it's like shitting on pop songs and then because going, you've but, heard them too many times on the yeah, radio but you're like, but you know why they're popular, it's because they're catchy and they have this mm. rhythm and this tempo and it attracts people towards it and then it's like well first, I haven't watched Pulp Fiction probably since the very first time I've watched mm. it 
I haven't watched it ever again, I don't think. But the first time I watched it, mine was like, yeah. I was like, oh my God, it's crazy. It's a great film. And there's so many pop culture references within it as well. And so then it becomes like an icon, a symbol. And it kind of then becomes like how Tarantino, we were talking about, mm. like pays homage in his copies of things. Yeah. Pulp Fiction is then paid homage within like t-shirts and branding and within like slogans and then also the archetype of like you talk about the film bro but then you also talk about like you could talk about like the manic pixie girl like fantasy of like like yeah, Mia like, Wallace yeah. like the dark haired like woman archetype yeah. it's like okay and then people reference it back to Pulp Fiction obviously you've got more modern mm -hmm. Nice, like a nice Scott Pilgrim vs. the World of yeah, 500 Days one. of Summer, which kind of reference that mm -hmm. archetype probably in the way that the archetype is now. However, you look at Pulp Fiction and you look at cinema beforehand and you had these archetypes mm -hmm. already. I think it's just that whole thing of when you can pay attention to it, especially now when you're this modern technology, there's mm -hmm. people reviewing things and talking about it in a discourse online, it can kind of be compared so much quicker. Yeah, and I think I think in a weird way, like especially with Tarantino stuff, where it's so reference packed, it kind yeah. of pre. See, he started. Reference Bar Dogs was what ninety four or something. I believe um, so. Yes. So like he started in the nineties, sort of pre internet era. But now, yes. instead of just Tarantino being this weird guy who watched every film in a video store because mm. he had access, film nerds now you don't have to go and spend a million pounds renting at Blockbuster. You no. can just go online. You have access to every film on the planet. Yes. For free, if you're, you know, not that I would ever pirate a film. No. But, <laughs> We'd you never know, do that. You, you have access to every film ever made. So the satisfaction in Tarantino films outside of just the story and the payoffs yes. and things like that is just from being like, oh, I got that reference. Yes. Oh, I understand why that's cool because I've seen this other film from the 70s. Oh, I'm... I'm I'm involved. I get it, you know, and it's and when predicted that culture, when pop culture is referenced again, it brings in an entirely another audience mm. because it can bring in the audience that understands that pop culture reference, and then those who are maybe young or haven't actually seen it then want to then go and find that pop culture reference to then understand what they've looked mm. at. Like for example, have you watched Community before? Yes. Community yeah. has so many video and TV and film references mm. within itself that obviously it's a Dan Harmon show, so him as a writer kind of references quite a lot and his universe can be quite huge. But that itself as a sitcom kind of defies where normal sitcom was seen to kind of go at the time. Yeah, and it appealed to a specific... Uh, that's the one show that people go completely one or two ways on when yes. i say like watch community you're either you grew up at the right time to understand the jokes yes or you just watch it like this like my mum said hilarious. she tried to watch it and was just like i don't get it it's so <laughs> funny but it's so good when you like have enough of a knowledge of the time period it's yeah based and, on and it kind of it knows that it won't like for example comparing that like a show like community which only has like six seasons like mm. five to six seasons. Yeah, it's a bit weird, isn't it? With yeah. web versions and exactly. oddities. But. And then you've got something like Always Sunny or Trailer Park mm. Boys uh, that have 14, 15, yeah. 16 and seasons. Going, like. But that as a sitcom, they know that... The joke in sitcom is that, like, so Friends, your archetype mm. of the sitcom, is like they all live in, they all visit the apartment because they're friends and they're, they all talk to yeah. each other and they've got their own lives going on. So some might be seeing someone else and someone might be thinking of moving out or getting a new job and you've got all of these things going on but when you entrench it within one singular place where it's like always sunny where it's like a bar mm. the options are like limitless because it's like there's a point where it's like these guys are growing old now that they would have started their own families or like walked away or not be working at the bar or yeah. they're not making enough money but they're still there and yeah, so then the show lives have gone nowhere. <laughs> exactly. And then the show's like, we're going to run with this. And that's basically the show. Because then as soon as you admit that the fact of that as a sitcom, it's not going to move from its original destination. Mm. They're always going to be there. That means that your characters can move almost freely in this way where it's like, 
when people write a sitcom, they'll be like, oh, this character wouldn't do this because of their morals and principles. But when you've like shoved them <laughs> in one place and kept them for so long, you're like, this character can do anything now because okay. it's like when Mac gets f- like fat. Like the joke in the cast was mm. like in sitcoms, you look look at Friends, and as the seasons go on, um, go on, they've all had like plastic surgery or had their yeah, hair done or teeth done. Looking. Yeah, they get thinner and skinnier, mm. and they get better looking. And then the idea was that they were all going to get really fat and get overweight because the joke was like, as the seasons go on, they all just get <laughs> worse looking and worse people. And then all the cast members basically didn't relay it back to him that they weren't going to do it. So on his first day, he turns up and he is overweight. <laughs> and they're all just like, we're just going to run with this for the season. And instead of being called Mac for the season, he's just called Fat Mac. And then it, it just... But, but that itself and like creativity of like you're playing with something like you're pointing at the audience in a way and being like, you know what we're yeah. doing. And yeah. As soon and you as have you have to have watched other sitcoms to understand. Yes. I, I mean, you could get it if you just have a dark sense of humor, it's, but I think there's another yes. layer of jokes as I think the difference in community, it's like what, when you brought up like friends and always sunny as well, mm. they're almost all the issues they deal with in all the situations yes. are fucking timeless and go on. Yes. Will always be a thing. Like they're yeah. in that situation, but they're heading towards, like Friends is heading towards the ideal version of, you yeah. know, life. And then Always Sunny's heading towards the sort of <laughs> squalor and just insanity. But still issues that were a thing 50 years ago will be a thing probably in 50 years time. Yes. Where I think community is really weird is like, I don't know if Community came out in 1980. I don't think anyone would have a clue what the fuck is going on. No, when they're talking about stuff. The same as if it comes out in 50 years, all the references are so dated to the point where it's like, yeah, no kids gonna sign the show and be like, oh, so I have to go back to like 2012 and yes. dig up all these YouTube series that they're referencing yes. to get it. Like, no, it's like <laughs> it's too um, timely almost. But what, what I like about Community is that all the characters kind of sit in at the start, they sit in the stereotypes of their own character. Mm. And as they go along, they kind of just, they just change just a little bit, but then they're pushed into environments where you just see like an absolute explosion of that character, the limits that they could go to, but in a way where it's just kind of like, it will all kind of, come together at the end of the episode and tie in like a nice neat bow and kind of go back to its beginning yeah. in a way and they'll kind of accept that it's gone back to the beginning mm. but knowing as the audience and them as the the characters that it will something mm. again will happen because yeah. it's kind of crazy like that because um, i guess that was like the rule with television especially in sitcoms was sort of mm. it has to you know an episode of the simpsons has to start and end with you know them being a family and yeah. that they always had to go back to like the same archetypes yeah so i guess in a way like um communities pushing it like how far can we take them away yeah <laughs> and still have them just come back at the end like the episode where they all get like the school forms like a cult around the app or whatever that's literally like the one i was about like, to say Logan's yeah Logan's run s society like, Meow Meow Beans and it's just like then how yeah. how much you can rate someone mm. on their own like worth and depending on where the rank you were mm you were either seen as like a god or you were like almost like a slave. Yeah. And it's just kind of like, then you see that like nowadays in a way, like within like Black Mirror did it like an episode. Yeah, they did. Which, which after came, Community. Was it after Community? Yeah. That's so Community funnier. does it first. <laughs> and so then you're kind of like, well, sitcoms kind of play with the idea and kind of laugh about it and kind of show us the good and the bad from it. Whereas like a show like Black Mirror kind of really kind of gets your stomach churning on something. So when yeah. these like dark comedy shows like kind of become like a series that is something amalgamating to something bigger, mm. it kind of allows for like how we were saying earlier for like these ideas and projects to develop. Like there will be people who are like, I don't like this. And they're like, that's probably the point of you to get like, not like it or mm. to like it. And so I think, yeah, how are we even talking about like always sunny? It's like the character's, do change slowly and gradually, but the world stays the same. The mm. world is the constant. The bar is the yeah. constant. And friends, the apartment is the constant. No matter who's living there, the constant is the sets. Yeah, it's, it, 
Well, it's interesting to think about because um, Friends especially doesn't fucking change. It's no. like the end. The, even when it gets into the early two thousands, like um, I don't even think in Friends they even start using mobile phones, <laughs> even though they would no. have been a thing. Yeah, they're still like picking up the rotary telephone in the flat. Yeah. There's always Sunny does have the episode where, you know, a Frank like loses his memory. Oh yeah. And then Dynasty have to play out that they like made, invented the iPhone or something <laughs> and just like, um, and he's just confused by like the modern technology, um, which is great. But it's like, um, there, there is that like weird thing where, um, so it's it's like the question of the Simpsons. It's like, how's Maggie still a baby? Season twenty seven. Exactly. Like, what is is like weird, but we just accept it. It's and almost like people they, would they don't want, age in yeah. a way. Because people definitely wouldn't want to see Maggie's teenage years. Like, no, I don't know who wouldn't. still watches the Simpsons, but a lot less would be same if with actually like the characters. Family ages. Guy as well. Mm. But the, then that's the thing that correlates between that art form and then the the visual. Like art that we try and do with photography and painting and whatever you have you know it's that these shows have built a foundation that is successful and digestible mm. keep saying that word digestible but it's <laughs> it's easy to consume it's easy to kind of yeah. take in kind of go okay i like that and kind of come away from it of where the start comes back at the end so, so you can, can kind of leave from it expectations like we said about Jackie Brown, like people yeah. came away from that in cinemas being like, well, that wasn't fucking Pulp Fiction. It's exactly. Like it wasn't meant to be Pulp Fiction, but because it came from Tarantino, they expected Pulp Fiction too. And in photography, like I've struggled with the idea with my books of being like, okay, so I've, I did this one mm. and then I went over here and then I went over here <laughs> and I went over here. Like, yeah. how do you find the, the through line that connects these different projects? especially if you experiment with like a slightly different visual style or grapple with different themes. It's like having to go back and look at like eight or nine different projects and go, so they all came from me, but people expect a certain thing from me. Well, it's like, like Wolfgang Tillman, for up. example. Mm. Like you look at his early work and, you know, Berlin and clubbing and documenting the yeah. LGBTQ plus community. You know, it's very raw and it's yeah. in your face. Like you've got like pages where you're flipping it over and it's just like friends who are naked mm. and you've got another page where there's literally his cock in some guy's mouth and you're like, what? You're like, oh my God, what the fuck? That's mm. crazy. But also like to me, I'm like, that's real. Mm. And it's like someone's documented that and I'm like, fuck, that's so tangible. And then you look at his real work and it feels more plastic and kind of like, it what feels like a safe bet. real work? Like the the stuff that came later on, yeah. Like, like, like so, so his newest work, sorry. Right, okay. Like so, his newest yeah. work is like very. It, it he is taking it on digital, and it's kind of more abstract, and it's kind of like I I know that there's this photo of his iPhone, and he's on. Well, pardon me, he's on like Facetime to someone, or it's just like a iPhone by like a hospital bed and some flowers, and I'm just like it doesn't speak to me at all. Is it that he's got to a point where like. And I, I actually, when we talked about Wes Anderson, feel that with some of his uh, later films where he's playing into the expectation and just sort of like, well, this is what I've gone, this is like, and some people, like, if it was the beginning of the career, you'd call that finding your style. Yes. <laughs> but I've always kind of uh, had this weird beef with it because we're constantly told at uni, just like, just find one thing and just do that. And I'm like, yeah don't have the uh either don't have the attention span or just like yeah recklessly want to play around but it's this uh thing where yeah it can come off as just playing completely safe and doing the same thing over and over again like the same with brands who are like well like you brought up mcqueen people with mm. new mcqueen are like they're just rehashing shit and saying it's new and yeah. it's the same thing and they're just or supreme designs now are very safe it's just like we know if we do a collab people will buy 400 quid why fuck with the formula well, yeah, that's the thing with fashion. Fashion is constantly changing. And I saw a uh, clip recently, actually. So I think the reason why I'm mentioning all these different uh, avenues, essentially, within art and creativity mm. is because, to me, I'm not just... Yes, visually, I can go, ah, oh, Daido Rayama, Noboru Shiraki, Bruce Gilden, mm. um Daisyo Yokota, like, I, you know, list you so many artists um, who visually 
I can connect with. However, there are still creatives who talk about stuff in the film industry, the music industry, what resonate with me. Like someone from the music industry, I can't remember who exactly said it, but the quote was on the lines of, fashion is constantly changing. The consumer, you know who it actually was? It was, um, which is one of the Gallagher brothers. I'm trying to remember who's who right now. <laughs> no, which Noel is, Liam was the singer, right? Yeah, so. Liam Gallagher, yeah. Noel, Noel had this quote basically saying, the consumer doesn't know what the mm. fuck they want. Mm. They don't. Yeah. If we played the music industry like how the consumer wanted it, they would listen to it and be like, actually, like, I don't know what I want because they don't. Like in fashion, if you go, if I say to you in two years time, what are you going to be looking to wear in summer? And if you go, I want this and a fashion brand went and did it and you got it, but in two years time, you might be like, oh, I don't want that actually. I don't, I don't want to wear this because you're sold something. You're mm. sold an idea, a vision, what it can be like to have this, to experience this. And so when new music comes out that resonates with people, it changes. It changes a lot of things. Like, for example, um, if we just stuck where music was and what people wanted music to be, I think it either wouldn't have changed at all or it would have taken a long while for music to take its new rebirth into other things. It'd probably just be Baroque and classical because right, never. the people who wanted music were people who could afford music, you know, to go listen to mm -hmm. an opera house or experience something. And then you think about jazz and the birth of jazz coming from, you know, more like not backgrounds of completely affluent mm. people. And then you think of blues and blues and jazz and then blues breeds into rock. And then you've got early style of rock and roll and how music kind of constantly amalgamated into new things. Like you could imagine in the 60s and 70s, somewhat like a dad being brought up on old time like american blues and maybe more sing-songy type you know country music and then seeing Jimi hendrix absolutely smash it out at woodstock playing the absolute crap out of a guitar making new sounds that mm. people might have not heard and he goes what the hell is this crap yeah. <laughs> but a kid is sat there in front of the tv just absolutely fucking having yeah. their mind blown by something new and sound because mm. like, they haven't got the expectations of what came no, before. No, exactly. They've never said, this is what music is, this is what a Tarantino movie is, this is what a Wolfgang Tillman project is. You exactly. Know I mean? They're going in completely fresh-eyed. and Sometimes I think being oblivious is some of the best thing within art to have. Because as soon as you set yourself up to expectation, you can have that expectation fail you drastically. Mm. It's like, for example... Um, when you have that conversation with people with films, you're like, what's that one film you wish you could rewatch for the very first time and not know anything about it? And most people will give you an answer that is probably either profound or something that is like either a Pulp Fiction or a Wes Anderson or something mm. where they're like, they just want to experience it for the very first time again. Not to know anything about anything to do with films or discography or anything mm. like that. Just to be almost like a child again in a way yeah be. and have that I, th I think it's it's like similar to going in with an open mind isn't it and yes and as well looping back to like our discussion about book forwards as well like that's why I laugh when you said about just like you'd skip over it and go back through because yeah they used to do the same thing and then when I realized that the the written part wasn't just complete like bullshit at yeah. the front. I used to still like, I'd flip through the photos first. And then if I connected to the photos, then read the forward. Read the forward, yes. And I found sometimes you'd uh, read the forward first and it would set an expectation. Mm. And then you turn the first page and sometimes it would be like, whoa, I connect these two things. And sometimes it would be like, that's not what I was expecting. You switch off a lot faster. Exactly. But then you've got like, and this is the beauty with an art and figuring out things and kind of, yes, experimental, but also just challenging certain things of going, okay, I'm going to put the forward at the back. Like, mm -hmm. I'm going to make you flick through the book and visualize the images and then the forwards at the back. Instead of going, I'm going to go right back to the beginning because then mentally you're kind of going all the way back and looking with fresh set of eyes at writing that then documents the images. And then as you're at the front of the book, you're kind of then in your mind going, okay, well, I'm at the front, so I might as well go through it again. 
Whereas if you yeah. put it at the back, it's like you've had that experience of seeing all mm. the images and then you're greeted with the forward or the conclusion mm. in a way uh, yeah. to, to the book. And I think that's probably where I'm trying to get to within this conversation and figuring out where I'm going with my craft at the moment is the problem solving. It's kind of... Mm. I l like if there's a bump in the road, then maybe we have to just adjust how we go over that bump or how we can successfully transport this idea from what this one stage to this next stage. And those problems and those mechanics of solving those things like a puzzle, I think can bring out new sort of ways of approaching work and craft that can allow it to be something else. Yeah. And it's, it's a strange, it's interesting you've posited it as, problem solving because a lot of people don't realize that being creative is problem solving yeah they think it's completely separate like um they they see it as completely different as like mm. i don't know someone who's a computer scientist is obviously problem solving as yeah. doing some creative is not seen as that even though that's what it is yeah and there's definitely it's strange because technically it's like it's it's problem solving but you're making your own boundaries because you're trying to achieve a specific thing yeah it's not like if you coded, there's a way coder and blah, blah, blah. It's like technically you could do everything, but in the back of your mind, you're yeah. like, you know that's not the solution because that's not going to achieve what you want to achieve. And it's weird because you feel like you're making up those rules in your head. But yeah. But they are tangible. I think what's kind of like nice about it is that when you can kind of find those things to kind of figure out like, for example, when I'm making a book, I'm usually like measuring out pages and mm. figuring out how I want it to look. And then maybe I'm making a physical dummy where I bought a notebook and I'm sticking in images and playing around with it. That itself is a part of the craft. And it's a part that I think as we go along and you come out of university, you're expected to be doing all of this X, Y, Z. And you kind of forget about the playfulness of creating like yeah. how just playing with art and creating things is is a childlike process you know you're you're, you're trusting your intuition you're mm. trusting the way that you could possibly see something in your brain and not maybe articulate and so you take out a camera or a canvas or you know, a pencil or a pen and, and you get to work and you create something from it. I think that itself as a process is amazing. And I think my kind of large point is that I think at times with visual media at the moment, it it seems more like down an avenue of that people want to be occupied. They want to have their, I don't think they want to have their attention stolen, but it seems that that's where a heavy shift of life is kind of living at the moment is having our attention span kind of drained or having time taken yeah. away from us by like apps or your phone mm. and media itself. Whereas, well, I think it's like the, it's strange because it is, it, it's proof we're, we're slaves to our <laughs> biology to yes. some extent because you do just, how many people who've, like, especially uh, lockdown was a big time. Oh, At least now people can, like, get distracted with their actual jobs or something like that. Yes. But it was so easy to be, like, I scrolled through Instagram for six hours and then I, I tabbed out and went straight onto YouTube shorts. And then I was on yep. TikTok and I was just, as soon as I got bored of one, I'm jumping back to and the other. And your eyes just, like, become heavy and yeah. you're just kind of like, oh, my God, I don't feel well. I feel oh, ill. Shit. And then it's just like, am I going to go outside? Or no, it hurts to look outside. It's so bright because yeah. I'm used to looking at my and phone. And trying to do anything else is fucking impossible. Yeah, because so. then your intention is just like, oh, I need that dopamine here. I need that mm. funny laugh right now. I need, I need yeah. to get this straight away. I need to yeah. be good at this. I need to be fucking the best bookmaker. I need to be amazing at bookbinding. Or I need to make a fucking sick photo book. Or I need to be able to get this right so perfectly the first time or else that's it, I'm done with it. And then that's what I feel like it breeds. It breeds this kind of mentality of, you know what, the the process of getting good mm. is, it's about the journey, not about the destination. And that's what's so beautiful about art is that you can constantly be playing around with it and figuring things out for your whole life and yeah. still be having fun from it. 
Whereas there could be someone else out there who's trying to, they have a career out of it and they're trying to piece it all together and they can't find enjoyment in their own creative work because mm. they're, there's the pressure there or they're trying to be yeah, so good at it and so great at it. At times I think it's, it's good to fuck up. Like it makes you human. Like you learn from mistakes as humans. Like we evolve, we change, we reflect and we kind of go on to do better. And I think the expectation to be good straight away or to have something right or to kind of just know things straight away kind of adds this expectation to you that if you do fail or you don't do mm. so good in something or you mess up or if a, you get set back with a deadline, let's say that you wanted to self-publish the book at one, the start of this month and then turns out you're actually publishing it in six months' time. Yeah. That journey, that means that, you know what, unless you did nothing in that period of time, the book has gotten better in that six months from when you've published it because you've yeah. taken more time and consideration mm. with it. And I think that there is a... I think that's sometimes why I'm drawn to less te technically sound and technically good images in photography mm. isn't because I can do it straight away and I can make a shitty image and chuck it in high contrast black and white and it looks mm. amazing. It's because I'm intuitively allowing myself to kind of question things mm. of, oh, that would be a cool photograph. I'll take a photo of that. Oh, that might not be a good photograph, but I'm going to take a photograph of it anyways and we're going to see what happens rather than being... No, if I take a photograph of it and, oh, shit, this looks shit. I'm looking back on it on DSLR mm. and I'm like, it's not good. Yeah, I'm packing it in. This project is mm. shit. Like, I don't know why I even gave it a gut. It's yeah. And it's what you're interested in as well. Cause there's exactly. That, there's that feeling of, like, I'm going to take the picture and it, let's see what comes out rather than, like, I'm trying to match this yeah. thing I have in my head and get it one-to-one -one like that because that becomes, yeah, an exercise in technical skill and precision but it doesn't achieving that you just achieve it and you're like okay i know what i'm doing but you don't then look at that work and go oh this weird thing happened i wonder what i could do from that it doesn't teach it doesn't give you as the artist anything to like yeah. build upon really it just kind of goes here's some stuff that was good and i think that translates to whoever you show it to as well they go yeah, it's technically impressive. Like the same with pop music or other stuff. People go, yeah, it's technically impressive. It's well produced. It's like, you know, what's been known as like aesthetically pleasing to mm. human beings. It's good. Move on. Yeah. It's when something's weird, it's like that compliment that isn't really a compliment. I'm not, I never know whether people mean it as compliment. Yeah. Where people go, I like it and I don't know why. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's like, oh, now it's, it's, that is a question rather than it's like why yeah not just cool lighting great yeah. tones or yeah. fire emoji <laughs> like, yeah. you know, it's it's summer um to go off that you can then spin a whole project off the back yeah of. and i think it's constantly that's what makes up your sort of artist journey is those little mm. moments where you're just like oh and here's another place you get to plunge into the, or just jump off the cliff and be like you know, some projects you end up in a place where you're just completely on the brink of like, I'm either a genius or I'm crazy. <laughs> and yes, it never really settles on one or the other. You just have to keep going and hope someone goes with you, I think. I'd but rather the expectation be set that I'm crazy than a genius because then if I did something <laughs> that was pretty somewhat good, I could be like, okay, that's great. And then just stepping be like, up, not yeah, stepping down. you know, <laughs> hey, I'm going up, you know, the sky's the limit, you know. But that whole thing of like, I don't know why I like it, but I do. Or I don't know, like, I like it, but I don't, like, I don't know why. Um, to me, it's, it's that kind of point where you're just like, okay. Because I, I feel that way sometimes with my own images. I'm like, I don't like why I like it, but I do. And there is that maybe that question there of like, why do I like this? And I think sometimes within imagery and the conversations that maybe you're having it in a crit or maybe you're showing someone uh, or maybe it's in a gallery, no matter the space that it is, I don't think that should mean this, like the question shouldn't be answered in a way. Like the curiosity should be explored because that's yeah. what, like how we're saying with like Instagram reels and like 
how our attention span is probably cut off and we want things to be short and sweet and we want it to be there and a dopamine hit. When you're trying to get someone to figure something out for themselves and you don't want to just shove it in their face and go, this is what it is, this is what it means, now you like it because of this. When you've got someone to try and figure it out, I think that's when you kind of like split apart your target audience. That's where you kind of push the tides away in a way like how Moses Mm. parted the Red Sea in a way. Like you kind of push them aside and it shows a clear path for your target audience. Mm. Because then there are people who go, I connect and resonate with this. And maybe I don't know fully why, but I feel something from it. And these feelings kind of, I see this throughout the work and blah, 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 rather than I like it, but I don't know why. And that means that's the end of it. Bye. You know, yeah. that means I'm not revisiting the work now. I'm not going to kind of explore why. And I think that's okay sometimes because... I think that's somewhat the world we live in, but it's also that I don't think enough people engage with art as much as maybe they ever think they do or th- as much as they want or should do. But it's yeah. at the same time... It's or like, just with anything. Not even just art. That yes. can expand to fucking food, to how you live your life, to anything. People yes. just get kind of like, just go along with it. It's is it. It's how it, it is because yeah. it's how it is. Don't question it. You know. What yeah. I, mean? I think I use art as like this wide mm. term and yeah. label because like, food is creative as well. well like, yeah. yeah uh, <laughs> yes. There's like the same with like photography mm. and other things. There is a process. There is like photography comes from science. There's chemicals. There's like you know when everyone's like you start shooting photography, it's like oh my image is so blown out. It's like oh then turn your ISO down and maybe the mm. shutter speed needs to be slow. Like, you know a higher shutter speed or the aperture needs to blah blah blah. Cooking it's the, it's like math in a way. It's like you need a cup of this. If you put too much cup of like if you put two cups in it, that means you've got to double everything else. It's mm. quantity. So there's a yeah. structure and a process. It's it's you know photography was called like a half art half science in its early days, mm. and that's very similar to cooking. There's exactly an art and it is grounded in some level of you I, know, like uh, say maths or yeah like i really enjoy cooking subject. like i think like when i can have a space to myself and i can cook and have music on mm. and maybe i'm like having a drink whilst i do i feel like great i feel like i'm creating something i'm having fun i'm enjoying myself i'm relaxing and it's then for someone else to take part in that like how you would with like an art piece or watching something or experiencing something, they're then experiencing something that you've made, which is incredibly baseline, Mm. very similar to how we show art or photography or things like that. You're taking something you've made, you've probably spent like a long time on it and you're showing something. It's like the comment of, I don't know why I like it, but I do. If someone said that about cooking, I don't know how I'd incredibly feel like you eating it it's like i like it it's great i don't know why but you do because it tastes good and sometimes yeah. it's just like it can just stop at that like you can explore mm. of why you like it like maybe there's a certain like gonna use both the analogies of cooking and photography here but maybe there's a shadow that you really like and the aesthetic's really cool or maybe it just tastes good yeah like, and I, I think cooking has a similar, or food, I, I do a lot of food photography, but mm. a similar issue where there is that level of like, here's, here's, your, here's your burger and mm. you eat it and it tastes good. Yeah. And it does have an effect on you where like three days later you might feel like shit because that shit gets yes. into your body and it does. Yeah. And there's other food like, you know, there's always that thing that people are like, healthy food's fucking boring and like yeah. dead and don't want to eat it despite being good for you. Fuck that. But it's like, it does, it's like, and I relate that to like photographers who like, I don't want to talk anyone down who's super technical and that's what they get their satisfaction yes. from because that's, it's it's what your end goal is. It's like, is your goal yeah. with photography to, you know, question and try and find what makes it tick? Yeah. Or is it, to produce really high quality images or is it just to you know take photos for your ebay account or is it to <laughs> take exactly, photos of yeah. your friends and family or is it you know there's so many multiple uses of it or is it just as like a form of note taking for you so you can come exactly. back to it later to write your book same same with food like is it just so you can make shit tons of money from selling cheap burgers or is it to uh focus on the nutrition of things or mm. is it to find new flavors or is it you know exp- there's different as- aspects to it that yeah 
if you're re- if you have the goal, that's what gives you the grounding, and then through that is people give you either a response of like that was shit or they're on the level and they're like oh I get it I get what you're trying to achieve this is actually interesting let's discuss it and that's better than just being like okay there's I'm surrounded by these 10 20 people how do I appease to them and on a grander scale there's a whole world of Instagram how do I appease to the maximum amount of people which i guess if you, that's your goal that's fine but if your goal is to have mm. interesting conversations you're not going to do that by like how do i make the most generic thing i can that appeals to the most people mm. i think for me like something i really realized recently i had it s- said somewhat by someone um like the idea of potential and the idea of like fulfilling your potential like i think Originally, it's very easy to get wrapped up, especially when you do a creative course, like university, and have lectures, like big up ideas, and like you could go do this in like Paris, or you could go be doing like this. I think for me, like I got to a point where I was like, I want to do like the best in like this category, and I think I then hit a wall at some point a couple of years ago, where I just I don't know if it was like a depression slump or something like that, but I just kind of came to like this nice acceptance that. I'm really, really happy progressing in photography the way I am, like self-publishing. Like I think for me, probably one big goal for mine is probably just to go to what it, I think off print at Tate. I think that's probably one of my biggest goals is to go at like the big print fair, have a stall and sell some work of handmade published books. And I think I'd be really happy with that, just going through my life and self-publishing and creating Mm. work without a strain of having to go incredibly through the industry and the art industry at the moment. Because obviously there's this whole, like, um, you can be self-made, especially with, like, Instagram, Mm. TikTok nowadays, you can self-made and you're essentially selling yourself. You're selling your your skills Mm. and this idea and this lifestyle and what you do. However, I think for me, I'm very much at a point where I was like, I'm probably always going to be taking photographs, whether it's seen as commercially successful, Mm. artistically successful, or just successful within my own right. And I think being wanting to be a creative and someone who likes seeing creative solutions to things i think that's why i call myself a creative or like an artist it's not not from the sense of that i think that i have this incredible gift that i can create things and see the world in different ways it's just that i think i have a different way that i like to solve problems and creative solutions to things and so for me i think i would just be happy with living the rest of my life like working any job if it still allowed me to have the enjoyment to see creative Mm. practice in a way where it's it's success through myself not success through the eyes of other people exactly Mm -hmm. and then it becomes i think when you see photographers who shoved into the limelight straight away and go create things or artists who do that and then they build their life together but their art is their main thing in their life because Mm. that's all that they've had like maybe validation from I don't want to like kind of become that as like an artist. I kind of, you know, I want to have a life. I want to like build on things. I want to go see the world, make friends. Like, yeah. And photography is a difficult difficult one because you have to, uh, like, it's probably the only art form where you can't get away with just like locking your bedroom door and just doing the thing. Exactly. Like, you have to experience things to get anything tangible unless you want to just take pictures of your bedroom wall. Yes. you know, a painter could just sit and paint and paint and paint and yes. just completely disconnect. You know, same with a writer. They could completely go live in a cave, not talk to anyone, but t- and photography. Just, just write from it, yeah. yeah. has to, it's a copy of something, so you have to go experience something to be exactly. able to copy it. And I think that, for me, that's what I want to do, is I just want to experience life and then mm. take those photographs along the way. And I'm sure enough, sure, at some point mm. I'll, stop on something and go okay here's a big project that i have big aspirations for Mm. but at the moment it's not that i'm limiting myself in the sense of oh i don't have aspirations or i don't have goals and things i do but at the moment i kind of see them more as like life goals of like less to do with incredibly creative things but more of like hey i want to have like enough savings saved up so i can Mm. move abroad i want to like uh be better at like managing certain things like finance or knowing ways that i could work f- like 
smarter not harder mm. in that phrase of like yeah. finding ways that you could do work for more money but less time because at the end of the day the, the i think the given for me is that time is limited mm. and as far as the time that i've got i want to capture it and i want to like enjoy it and maybe capturing it and taking photographs isn't the part of reflecting and looking back to enjoy it but the part of taking the photograph is giving acknowledgement to something so you're present yeah. and i think that's always what i want to kind of do no matter if that line takes me into creative work more and it becomes really successful or if i go into something else completely different in my life i think being present and documenting that either within your own memories and being thankful and, and gratuitous to those things or even you know paying attention through the camera I think it allows you to be in the present. So then when you kind of reflect back on those memories, however long, if it's a day, a month, a year later, when you're looking at the images, you're kind of thankful that you were there in the first place to kind of experience it, yeah, as you were saying. Yeah, that stuff. Yeah. Mm. And I think that's kind of where, like, on Instagram, things like that, I kind of don't feel, like, the necessity to, like, post all the time. Like, mm. uh, if I'm doing, like, a book... Like if I'm self-publishing a book for like two or three weeks before, I'm probably making posts, making reels, you know, trying Pre-promo to get the, stuff. Yeah, That's trying no to get the engagement up, selling anything. Exactly. Know. However, then when that stops, I don't feel the need to continuously carry on. Yeah, and be a sort of a content creator or influencer because well, exa- like that will again you're you're fitting your work into a specific thing. Which is to be yeah. like your your then your goal doesn't then become let's see where it takes me. It then becomes let's make it so that I know I have enough content for this week and I'm yes. going to keep being existing. And we've all been there. Like I, I've done it where I've scheduled for like two weeks in mm-hmm. advance, like posts that are yeah. all going to go out. But I think I've just got to the point now where it's like I'm kind of trying to get to the point where I don't care as much anymore with mm. it. Where I'm just like I'm happy with it. Yeah. So then I'm like, hey, I'm just going to post today. And I don't care what time or how many people are yeah. going to see it. I'm just going to post. But then you kind of get into this little headspace of, oh, but I do I do want people to see this. And I do want, yeah. you know, it to get attention. And it is, I think the problem is, is Instagram has become like that app in the community episode. Yes. It went from not being a thing to being a very tangible, accepted thing of value. It's having, validation. Having, yeah. yeah, it's validation. But also, like, having a high number of followers does change how people talk to you. Yes. How getting loads of likes on your post does change how people perceive you if they're going to message you off yes. the back of something. It's like comments now, I think, mm. instead of likes. I think it's how many people... For me, that's mm. how I view an account. It's like, if you've got a lot of people engaging with your mm. account through comments yeah. or shares and stuff like that or you're seeing it on your stories then to me i'm like whoa this is kind of big like yeah it's not just botted or pe- various people exactly across. it's not just like spammed with like 100 yeah. likes or 200,000 mm. likes and you're like oh my god that's amazing i think for me it's like i think most people nowadays it's like it's got into this whole thing of like everyone looks in the comment section yeah because the comment section becomes its own community and, mm. and conversation and within yeah what is being so shown. a little bit more than just like here it is hit the like yeah. scroll on and like loads of fire emojis but then maybe you've got <laughs> loads of people actually yeah. being like really cool book mm. i like this or amazing mm. cooking janice like i'm gonna use this recipe at home this week for the kids like i don't know but like for example like i think for me i don't know if there'll ever be a point where maybe i move away from social media mm. but I like the idea of the prospect of it happening to a point of where, because if I could just self-publish books and people could find them in an avenue that wasn't through social media, a hundred percent I'd be doing that. But that means I've got to be contacting bookshops and then I'm like worried about the people who actually already follow my content or follow the work that I make. And I'm just like, oh, am I going to lose those, all the friends that I've made from like mm. going abroad to a country and then you meet yeah. a photographer. I mean, it's and it's like a great way to keep in contact with people and exactly. keep tabs on what they're wanting to show the world. I think the problem is it becomes like a a valued thing beyond that, mm. which is like you can make one of your works that you're like, I've got this set of photos or photos that gave me the biggest artistic breakthrough and mm. 
realization and mean so much to me. Yeah. And in your head, you're like, this is like what I consider a masterpiece. If I saw one of the greats doing it, you're like fucking stoked. Put it on Instagram, two likes. (laughs) And immediately it just shatters the entire, none of that stuff matters anymore. And that's the problem with like, because the algorithm isn't just basing it off of quality. It's no. off of, it's like, well, you haven't posted in six months, so you're not helping us as a company. So go, you're going to get punished. Why yes. would, why would we push you to people when we don't know if you're ever going to post again? But the thing is also that Instagram tricks you because mm. it will also send out that notification that, Hey, this person's posted mm. to their story or posted for the first time in a while. Yeah, yeah. And then that person gets pushed on that notification. Now, I also think that, like th- that's where like the validation needs to like how I'm saying like like the potential within people and like that self publishing I think it's all from the self it's like mm. if you can be so secure that you can upload all your work to Instagram and only have like 20 followers and be happy that your account mm. never ha- ever grows and that people never see your work other than let's say your friends and your family yeah and if you're happy with that and you're content with that, then I think, I think you have hit where a lot of creatives want to go. And that yeah. is just being, having the being peace of mind of being off. reassured. Because well, loads of people are like, I'm just going to get as big as I can and then I'm going to delete fucking Instagram. But for now it's a necessity. But the, the yeah. issue is it's, um, it plays fucking games with you because yeah. you'll get lower likes on that first post back. And yep. then because of that, you're like, fuck you, my work's good. I'm going to post again and then yep. I'm going to post something better and put more effort in and yep. it gets a little bit more. So you're like, cool. Or if you stop posting for a while, I've, I notice if I stop posting for a few weeks, I suddenly start gaining random followers. Yep. Like there'll be a series of days where I'll gain four or five followers a day and then you start going, oh, I'm doing really well on Instagram actually. I'm going to get yep. back into it. And then you start posting. They all unfollow because it was, they weren't ever involved anyway. They're random fucking people. Yep. They're that probably they not even real. The algorithm probably suggested to yeah. you just to get me to pull back in pull back in so it's all about keeping you like th- and everything in the world does it supermarkets put smaller tiles on the sweet aisle so you think you're walking faster when the trolley's rattling so you slow down you're more likely to buy stuff mm. world of warcraft has a whole team dedicated to like picking color palettes to make the game more addicting yep the whole thing is about tying you into it yep putting your self-worth into it and that can become Obviously, it's a great tool for promoting your work if you're trying to sell mm. books or uh, create a sort of diary online to people mm. you don't see often. It's great. But the problem is it ties in with your self-worth and can hijack your dopamine and that can get massively in the way of producing what your like initial intention was. Yeah. Because if you're aiming to explore, sometimes you're going to wander around for six months and not find anything, yep. which for Instagram is like unacceptable for you to do that. Yep. You need to constantly have it and stuff. And my thing is that I like, I think after a while it becomes, it's this whole thing of that you're followed by people and you follow people rather mm. than it just being like, here's my work. Yeah. Come see it if you want to. You do like the idea of someone sticking around because they follow your account and then all of a sudden you get unfollowers and you're like oh who's not like looking it it, it breeds insecurity yeah. and it breeds like a an environment that isn't nice and i think that's kind well, of it's inherent it's like facebook used to have friends yes so it was like a symmetrical you they sent the request you accepted it and then it's like one together to one. whereas instagram has this thing where you can be shady and unfollow people and them not know that you've unfollowed them and it sets up a bit of a power dynamic. Yes. Where it's like, this person follows me. I don't know them, so I'm not going to follow them back. But then you might meet them. And in your head, you're like... And the other way around as well, you might follow someone and then they reach out to you for some reason. You're like, oh my God, this person's talking to me. Because in your head, it automatically sets up kind of a hierarchy of like, yes, these people follow me. They're not in the category of like yes. people you know and friends. They're... Mm-hmm it's just yeah and like you say people can be shady and will like act nice just to get, like literally yeah. to get followers and then do other various things mm-hmm. like respond to your stories just so their post show to you when you go back on because yep. it's t- bring because i'm pretty sure um a tactic is to just go on instagram stories give like one of the emoji responses so that person goes on instagram you set up 
your mutual followers all to be on Instagram, then you post, they're more likely than to see your post. And then they think they're getting like positive reaction to their own work when really you're just trying to bolster your own thing. And it's, there's all these games going on that yeah. confuse the fucking shit out of having any form of like social interaction with people. Yeah. Because it's so intertwined with the sort of quote unquote old fashioned way of going to the pub and talking to random people yeah, and making exactly. friends. Um, I, th- I think that's why I kind of want to lean towards having a website that just mm. archives my work and that I mm. can then every so often on Instagram put out a post here or there, maybe mm. put a post of a print that I framed or something like that or a project or a gallery or a book that I've made but then keep it to that, not having to feel like I have to upload everything of my visual discography yeah. because I can then do that on a website so much more. Mm. And, and get it, into it a lot more. Yeah, and it kind of be not then, there's no, there's no bar that says followers. There's no bar that mm. says following. There's no bar that says this person like this. There's only the added thing of the, if you add an email address, mm. For someone yeah. to send over queries and someone could just literally send you, hey, I looked at your website, really cool work, yeah. love it. And you're like, damn, that made my day. Instead of on Instagram where you've got, fuck, algorithm shows that 2,000 p- people have viewed my my post. Mm. Why have only 20 people liked it? <laughs> yeah. And you're like, and, is that the... And it why have it? like 40 people saved it and 20 people sent it to other people? Like, And then you're yeah. scratching your head and you're like, What's th- going on? those analytics yeah. and those comparisons that then you set yourself up for... I don't I don't think it breeds insecurity. I think there's already like a an insecurity going around. It just within. highlights it. Yeah. It just brings it to light. It, it puts the forefront it, of your mind. It makes you think about it. As like you say, you put it on yeah. a website and then get an email response. You're then focused in on that one email. It, it yeah. stops it being quantitative and it becomes a sort of qualitative experience where you're just yeah. getting some sort of feedback. And if someone's bothered to write an email, they probably have something to say. Yeah that hopefully will give you that like, oh, that's an interesting thought. Exactly. I can go make more stuff about that rather than three fire emojis Mm. out of 2,000 that didn't send fire emojis and you're going, oh, what the fuck is going on? Like, why didn't everyone else send me fire emojis? Yeah, exactly. What am I doing wrong? Yeah. You know. Um, Or the worst one, I have this many followers and and I'm following this many people. That means I'm only really popular by a difference of like two, three hundred people. Yeah. (laughs) It's like... Oh, it's I, th- I think for horrid. me, like, I don't know. I think I've got the account now. I have Instagram, like, I post to it. I feel like at this point, I'm kind of just like, I'm just going to, I don't know. If it dies out, it dies out. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But I don't think I'm, I. this is the one thing that I think I've always feared. I saw it in, like, YouTubers back in the day mm. when you were a kid. And you're like, what's this YouTuber going to be de- doing when they're 40 or 50 are they still right. going to be making youtube videos and i think when i, when I get to like 50 am i still going to be uploading to the same instagram account and if yeah. that's the case you know say la vie like it, it might be the yeah. thing and it might actually be fine mm. or maybe there'll be a new app or maybe it'll just fully die like myspace or something like that because yeah. there'll be a new platform however as long as you've got something like reels there which is an attention drawing mm. thing the app can be self-sufficient, almost like it's very mm. parasitical in a way, like yeah. a parasite. It it feeds off the viewer, giving it attention. Yeah. So there might be at some point where people don't give it so much attention and the app dies. But I think the more likely thing is it there will just be a graveyard of accounts, of mm. inactive accounts where artists might not use Instagram or use a platform anymore. But I think smart creatives who can work that sort of field will always use something that is magnetizing to draw people's attention in because Mm. them themselves can have that same effect on like-minded people who want to have a look at their account but i think for me at this moment in time yeah i really like the not organic way of looking at it but like yeah making stuff self-publishing having a website Mm. keeping it small and minimal because then it's still somewhat tactile to me, still tangible, yeah. still mine. It's still... It's physical. It's like putting it, like you say, organic, putting it in the real world. Like yeah. Feeling like it's, you know, 10 real people holding a book is, you know, probably the equivalent to like a million views, <laughs> possibly yeah. more. Well, it's it's that feeling of enjoyment. Mm. It's like, how like, am I ever going to be like 
So if a hundred people were standing in this room right now mm. looking at a print of mine, would it be any more meaningful than just having one person who means the world to you look at that photo? Yeah. So where do you quantify mm. like that? And I think that's where followers kind of go on Instagram. It's like, you know, I could have like 300 followers, but there would be like 300 people that like my work and equally I get along with them really well and they might be close friends and family and I'd be happy having it like that, mm. you know? like, And it's almost strangely preferable over having like 10 million people who you never meet and never exactly. have any real substance. With uh, yeah. regards to what you're doing or what they're doing. Yeah, exactly that. Oh, damn, dude, I feel like Instagram's going to send us like a cease and desist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering. I'm no, no, I, I, I don't think it's like... It's not from the fact of like, we all use the platform. And I think it's more just like a conversation of, mm. you know, if there was a way that you could talk to Instagram and be like, hey, these are some of the things that I'm trying to address here, what, what I'm saying... Yeah, yeah I mean, if it's not going to like affect them, they probably won't care that much. But oh, they're making money. They don't give a shit. <laughs> but I, I <laughs> think... Why would they? It's, I think um, it's more the fact of, like, it's less of the platform name itself, like Instagram mm. or YouTube or... It's, it's the uh, concept Google of social or, or like, media. Yeah, mm. but it's also the concept of it being... Um, it's in my pocket. <laughs> That's the only way I can put it. True. It's literally in yeah. my pocket. Um, and if it's not, it's like, where's my phone? Where's my phone? Oh, yeah. there's my phone. What notification? Dopamine hit. I'm Straight away, I'm hooked. The world. Yes. Yeah. And so for me, it's kind of like, well, I just like the idea of it almost going back to a time before social media. And I would never be able to create that reality in its entirety because social media will, will exist in this reality yeah. but i can create a world where my life isn't ruled and defined by social media yeah. and posting to it and having like my artwork judged on social media and i, and I think the world is going that way like a lot of people feel very mm. similarly like i think it's just about resetting the the unexpected component of social media was that it just kind of latched into everyday life like say it's in your yeah. pocket every it's shifted social relationships everything's been kind of adjusted by it that was never really the intention mm. like when people first downloaded it they're like oh it'd be cool to put a picture of the yeah. walk I went on the other day and show my friends without having to like yeah. message or like meet up with them and show it it's like cool but like it turned into this whole different thing where people took advantage of it and like used it and it mm. has this offset effect like all of the mental health things that people yeah. suffer with pretty much conclusively because of social media and things like that, how it shifts. It, it's another obstacle in the way of just being able to like do what you do mm. um, as the way you want to do it and how you know it probably should be done to achieve like the the best depth out of what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and that applies to anything. It can kind of, it's another sort of, Thing in the way that changes it and pushes you one person it's about I don't know I don't, like you say I don't think it'll go away no. I don't think people are going to just give it up I just think it will redefine itself yeah. and readapt and people will kind of begin to see the lines it'll become like, full circle become yeah. meta everyone will be like Yo, have you heard of this like new social media it's called like going to the pub and talking to people it's like <laughs> it's like crazy like so I'm actually like, sharing stories in real life <laughs> Like, I'm actually, like, talking to people. I could do fire emojis in real life. Like, <laughs> what? Like, it's crazy. You'd never believe it. This is like one of those memes your dad puts on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Social media? No. Like, I don't, don't do it. Just like... <laughs> Facebook, what book has your face in it? That's not how you read a book. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. <laughs> like, just something so dumb and silly like that. Oh, yeah, dude. Is, is there anything else you want to want to touch on? Because I, I think I just like, also want to touch base and just say, like, I don't think I'm like the most intellectual person, <laughs> like yeah, out there. I, I don't. I'm not incredibly successful. I'm not like made it. So, I think like if anything of what I've said, like how I said it from the beginning of like, if you agree or disagree with me, I think that's great. And I'd love 
like you know I, I love the the conversation behind like it. I don't want it to be like a brick wall in a way and I think I'm still f- kind of figuring out my points of where yeah photography kind of sits upon at the moment and I just hope that yeah anyone that listened kind of enjoyed the uh the tangent in a way and could kind of somewhat relate to it so probably someone will go home and be like i could have said that in two minutes that whole <laughs> like that whole podcast what that boy was talking about right there i could have said what he said in two minutes or in like 50 words and i'll just be like i could have tweeted it yeah <laughs> oh god but no i i think i i really enjoyed this yeah I, I think um what you guys are doing here is um it's a very valuable opportunity to kind of talk about things learn about things but also just kind of give creatives that opportunities kind of be in a uh, a position just to kind of talk and figure things out and give people Thanks, a man. voice essentially it's what we wanted to provide so you've <laughs> hey we hit the <laughs> hit nail on, on the head, head. <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right cool yeah perfect Thanks,